Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab, all on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome and good morning or afternoon. I'm Steve Morrison, Senior Vice President here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. We're delighted again for the 10th time to be co-hosting with Jennifer Cates, Senior Vice President at the Kaiser Family Foundation, these biannual events that try to take account shortly after each international AIDS conference of what exactly transpired. What were the most important developments scientifically, politically, programmatically? And how does this conference set a course for what will unfold in the future, including the next International AIDS Conference? The International AIDS Conference has remained signature defining moments in the history of the world's HIV AIDS efforts. My, co my colleague, Catherine Bliss, authored in 2012, a history of these conferences, which remains very relevant. I encourage you to look at it if it interests you. Catherine Bliss, titled The International AIDS Conference Returns to the United States, March 28, 2012, on the CSIS.org site. This year is truly exceptional, as we know, coming in the midst of a raging coronavirus pandemic, the first instance in which a large and complex enterprise like this International AIDS Conference has been conducted virtually. We at CSIS over the past year and longer have been very busy in supporting the leadership of the conference. We have a highly active American Friends of AIDS 2020 group, which I co-chaired with Ernest Hopkins, and in which everyone who's speaking with us here today has contributed and participated, among many others. When we launched a very active podcast series, AIDS 2020 SF slash Oak, which many of the speakers here today also contributed and which I hope many of you have been able to enjoy and will continue to enjoy. Before we get started, I wanna offer special thanks to my colleague, Maggie McCartan Gibbs, who worked very hard to pull all the pieces together today. And I wanna thank my other colleagues, Clifton Jones and John Montz, who are producing this event for, for us. I also want to commend the leadership for its courage and perseverance through this difficult period and for making the tough and very abrupt decision this spring not to postpone, but to pivot to a virtual conference and to do what, it need, what needed to be done on an urgent crash basis amidst all the uncertainty and complexities to pull together the conference. Kevin Osborne and Birgit Poniatowski, leadership at the IAS deserve special praise for mobilizing their team in record time under exceedingly demanding circumstances. They kept their cool, their good humor, and their optimism throughout. We should direct the same praise to the co-chairs, Anton Pozniak, Cynthia Carey Grant, and Monica Gandhi. Cynthia and Monica, working with Rob Newells and Larkin Callahan and Helga Ng from the IAS, worked flat out over many months to mobilize the communities in Oakland and San Francisco and lay, lay the local preparations. It was no doubt a great disappointment to not be able in the end to hold the conference in these two cities, but all of these efforts were not lost in the transition and the translation to a virtual mode. We will hear more about what was possible from our speakers in a moment. Here is how we're going to proceed this morning. We don't have a lot of time and we're gonna cover a lot of ground. We're going to spend the next 35 to 40 minutes in conversation with our four speakers. We'll hear first from Monica Gandhi, professor of medicine at UCSF and San Francisco General Hospital. She directs their HIV work and she is the co-chair of the San Francisco. We'll hear next from Shannon Hader, executive, deputy executive director for program at UNAIDS in Geneva, followed by Jennifer Cates, senior vice president for Global Health at the Kaiser Family Foundation, along with Greg Millett, Vice President and Director of Public Policy at AMFAR. We're gonna roll through three questions. I've asked our speakers to 
keep their answers short and we wanna have a very interactive uh, conversation and we'll leave time to come back to the audience and pull in some of the audience's questions um, uh, as we move through. So let's, let's start out with the first question. And that first question is really to, to try to identify from our four speakers, what are the two to three most significant things that happened during the conference? Monica, you wanna head that off please? Yes, I think one of the biggest things that happened is when we made the decision to go virtual, which was um, completely uh, no brainer because there was no option to come together in person uh, with the pandemic. Uh, we realized that we couldn't actually just address HIV. In fact, it was, uh, we were trying to plan the sessions for HIV and it seemed almost irrelevant to not talk about COVID and the impact of COVID on HIV and the and COVID alone. So I think the biggest thing that happened was um, uh, organizing the first abstract driven COVID related meeting um, simultaneously with the 8th 2020 meeting. So the 8th 2020 meeting was uh, for the first four days, July 6th through 9th and July 10th was exclusively a COVID meeting. Beyond that, the second most significant thing was putting in the impact of COVID-19 on HIV into every abstract session for um, the, uh, the, uh, cat the typical categories for the late breakers on AIDS 2020 so that everyone was invited in all categories to put something in on the impact of COVID-19 or the interplay of COVID-19 and HIV, if it was the basic science category, for example, or the impact, and UNAIDS actually talked a lot about the impact of COVID-19 on HIV. So that was the second most significant thing. And then there were, I think we'll get into it later in the program, the, the very significant abstracts um, that occurred, but, but I think I'll stick with this for now to just say that uh, it really was a tale of two pandemics completely woven through. And I think Dr. Millett's uh, 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 talk actually exemplified that, but so did many, that this concept that there was no way to untangle them anymore because the effect on disproportionately how HIV affects communities, the same things happening with COVID, how uh, uh, Shannon Hader talked about it when she gave the UNAIDS update, it was completely you're unable to speak about progress in HIV without talking about the setback in progress that's occurring with COVID-19. So I think that is the biggest way I wanna start with what, how this was so different from any other meeting. Thank you, Monica. Shannon, your two to three top, top thoughts. A really great on-ramp, right? Um, <laughs> I, think, I think for me, for UNAIDS, certainly, this conference is a milestone in the year where we get to take stock of where the world has gotten to in the HIV response the year before. And so this conference was the launch of the world's 2019 data of progress against the global HIV targets and the update data on progress for the three free, start free, stay free, stay free for pediatrics. And, you know, as we're one year away from that 2020 data before we launch into the next sort of strategy, I think marking the fact that there's been such tremendous progress, but we're also, we're going to miss the 2020 goals even before COVID came into play. You know, we're still seeing nearly 700,000 deaths from AIDS per year. We're still seeing 1.7 million new infections. You know, we've, we've, got now 63% of all new infections among key population members. And frankly, we have plateaued with our pediatric new infections and our pediatric treatment coverage. I mean, treatment coverage for kids of only 53%, that's criminal. And so already having that stock, having this unpredictability, but this real worry of how, how backwards we might go in some places during COVID, it just really emphasized the frame that we've got massively unequal progress. The fact that we see so many tremendous, I think, successes just says whether it's across regions, um, across countries, within countries, and particularly among populations and peoples, these remaining inequalities, we've just got to like jump into. Um, second 
thing that came out, I think, from some really interesting data in the conference, but is also enhanced by our COVID context, is the importance of human rights. Um, there was a really, I think, um, striking abstract from Lyons that showed um, that men who have sex with men living in African countries where oh. HIV is criminalized have way higher HIV rates. You know, they compared um, countries with no criminalization that had rates of 8%, countries with criminalization had HIV prevalence rates of 20%, and countries with really severe criminalization, because we still have countries that have death penalties and really severe sequelae with HIV prevalence rates of 52%. So we can't deny, we never have, but we've got to sort of say everybody who touches HIV programs and policies at all, I don't care what your discipline is, we can't ignore human rights. And when we see in some countries how COVID has actually provided this excuse, a wrongheaded excuse to use and put in even more severe infectious disease policies um, to persecute vulnerable populations, including key population members, we've just got to say no. And then I think third, it was um, really exciting to see and reconsider even the next focus on differentiated services, you know, policies, practices, and packages, and what they're going to mean. To ironically see rapid scale up of some things that have been stuck like multi-month dispensing or telemedicine that are now being put in place because of COVID but should service for a long time um, to really re-emphasizing that um, packages that include let's say STI uh, diagnosis and treatment or hepatitis C treatment if we're gonna reach some people who haven't been reached yet we've got to rationalize those packages to really respond to their comprehensive needs and not just HIV. So those are a few of the things that really caught my attention. That's great, Shannon. Thanks so much. Jen Cates, your thoughts? Hey, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, and thanks, Steve and Maggie and CSIS, everyone at CSIS for, for this, but also for our partnership on, on doing this every other year. We actually talked about whether we should do it this year. And um, uh, you know, part of the reason we do it is to because it's hard for any individual to, to fully grasp what happens at the conference. And I will say it's not easier when it's a virtual conference. So um, we'll do our best to capture the main things. Uh, so picking up on, on some of the things that people said and, and, and trying to add to them, there's three things I wanted to highlight. Um, one is, is the pivot of the HIV field um, around COVID. I want to say something about that. Two is just there, there was a lot of science at this conference. I'm just going to mention two, two studies or three, uh, three things that I just want to make sure people are aware of. And then a third um, is in these readouts, we often talk about the role of the US government. So I just want to say a couple things about that. So on the first, um, we heard about from, from Monica and, and, and um, Shannon and, and Steve said at the beginning, there was no way to separate out COVID and the impact that that's having on everyone's lives from the HIV response. That's, you know, um, we'll be living with that for a very long time. What's I think really amazing and, and important is that the HIV field, given the experience of researchers, advocates, policymakers, and others in dealing with an infectious disease for so long and all of the challenges that it um, brings in terms of um, research, whether it's in the lab, um, uh, delivery of care, um, how, to, how to quickly be, how to be innovative, how to adjust, that's what H the HIV response has been about. And because so much of that expertise is in, that, in our community, there was an incredible pivot of the community to take this on. And um, in some cases that's been really hard because some of the key researchers and many of us working have had to put a lot of time in that and that has an impact on HIV, um, the HIV response. But it's also, I think, a testament to, to the expertise and, and long, long um, uh, experience that people have had in dealing with, with another pandemic. And that came through in the conference. Um, and I, I just think it's quite notable. And, and many of the people, as we know, who are working to um, advance the research on COVID are coming out of the HIV field. Second, there were advances in the science um, and a couple that I want to highlight. Um, one, what are the results of HBTN 0 83 which is comparing the efficacy of long-acting um, injectable uh, PrEP, uh, cabotegravir, 
with daily oral Truvada for PrEP. And importantly, finding that it was uh, as effective. Um, there's still a lot of questions, uh, but it's, it's definitely the, where we're moving in the future is to long acting um, injectables for PrEP or for, for treatment. So having that, that data uh, be presented was really important. Impor uh, I'll just wanna highlight that that's, that um, trial was with cisgender men and transgender women who have sex with men. There's a companion um, a study going on, HPTN 084 for cisgender women. So we still need to, to have those data to get the full picture. Um, and it's important that those both those trials are being done, but it was you know, uh, a step forward in understanding that we can be moving this direction. It's very promising. Um, there was more data presented um, confirming the um, importance of uh, Delutegravir as a uh, recommended regimen for pregnant women who are HIV positive, that it's not likely to cause more um, neural tube defects for infants. There had been, not without going to the whole history, this was just another, you know, the, the follow-up at this point, I think was really important to have there. And then the third um, thing that I put in the category advancements in science um, is that there was such a rich discussion, and I just know Greg will probably get into this, on the importance of social determinants of health and how to, and, and race and equity and how to, you, how to, you can't disentangle any of that from understanding the HIV response. Um, and I felt, felt like there was a, a new emphasis on that um, in, a, in a very prominent way. Um, so those were the science piece. And then lastly, on the US government, the US has always played a key role in these conferences um, in many different ways. The, the US government has funded these conferences and, and was a funder, one of the funders um, of this conference. Uh, through presentations um, of U.S. leadership, through uh, much of the research, some of the research I cited was supported by NIH. Um, but it, it is the and, and many of the key officials involved in the U.S. global and domestic HIV response were did present at the conference. But it was a different feeling um, because many of them are now being pulled to address COVID, um, and uh, and this was um, one of the things that they were participating in on in while their attentions are, are elsewhere. And I think that was, it was commendable that they were participating. I mean, Dr. Tony Fauci was in, I don't know how many things he did, but he, um, he was ever, ever present. Um, and I believe Steve will be talking to him later today, actually. Um, but you know, that there, there, it was, it was mixed in, in their presence, but it was still, there was still a presence there. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much, Jen. Greg? Sure, thank you. And, and again, thank you for pulling together this, this uh, forum for all of us to really reflect on what took place during the conference. You know, I think for me, the three takeaways that I had um, was um, you know, past this prologue and COVID-19 and HIV and social determinants of health, as well as disparities, that was the first. Uh, the second um, is COVID-19 susceptibility and some of the uh, science out there in terms of HIV and susceptibility to COVID-19. And the, the third, um, which I think Shannon started to really get into a little bit was, um, you know, policies matter and they continue to matter in terms of how health outcomes for people living with HIV. So really to take a look at some of the science that was presented in the first bucket of disparities, um, there was a study that was presented looking at um, opportunistic infections in Latin America for people who are taking HIV treatment. They had a total of 9,000 participants across several countries, and they still saw this high proportion um, of um, opportunistic infections, despite the fact that we have ART available uh, for pulmonary tuberculosis, candidiasis, PCP, et cetera. Um, and then the disparities issue as well, where we're seeing that younger individuals who are HIV positive, um, as well as women, uh, were far more likely to have these OIs. Um, I think the second thing in disparities, you know, really came out in terms of um, PrEP. Um, so there was a study in the UK that was taking a look at how successful they've been in reducing um, HIV diagnoses by um, the increase in proportion of individuals taking PrEP and MSM um, in clinics in the UK, but they still found that um, blacks, as well as other ethnic minorities, particularly those who were born overseas, were far less likely to have access to PrEP. Um, and uh, those, those successes were not being born equally within those communities. 
There's also a PrEP study in the United States that showed that at least 28,000 women in the U.S. have started PrEP. And it's good to see that we're seeing more PrEP uptake among women in the U.S. The problem, though, and this is where the disparities issue comes back in again, um, is that most of the women who were taking PrEP uh, were from the Northeast states. Um, and those states where we know PrEP need is the most, which is the South, where we have higher rates of HIV, um, the PrEP uptake was really lagging. So that was the first bucket in terms of disparities. I think the second thing that came out was COVID-19 susceptibility um, for people living with HIV. Uh, there was a study, a small study in South Africa that found that the strongest risk factors for COVID-19 death in the Western Cape population were older age and diabetes and TB. Uh, but they found that approximately 8% of COVID-19 deaths could be attributed to HIV. Um, but at the same time, the presence of TDF, tenofovir, in ART regimens was associated with a reduced risk of um, HIV, of death, which was really interesting to see. There's also a study from the US, a VA study, it was a cohort study of about 6,000 and veterans. Um, and they found essentially no differences uh, between those veterans who are HIV positive or HIV negative um, on a range of um, outcomes related to COVID. Um, they didn't find any differences in hospitalizations. They didn't find any differences in um, ICU units, um, intubation, mechanical ventilation, or even death rates. Unfortunately, though, they did find that Black veterans made up over 70% of the cohort, um, and they were more likely to have COVID compared to white veterans, and Latino veterans were also 40% more likely to have COVID uh, compared to white veterans. So that disparity issue was still there as well. Um, there was also a London study um, that found that people with HIV did not suffer worse outcomes after admission to a hospital um, with COVID-19 compared to people who didn't have HIV. Um, so it was really interesting to see this whole issue of COVID-19 susceptibility and some of the data that are coming out uh, for people living with HIV really starting to grow, that, that research base starting to grow as part of this conference. I think the third bucket, though, is, is policies. And I, I think that Shannon did a great job in mentioning um, a study that I was also going to highlight in terms of MSM living in African countries that criminalize homosexuality, where essentially they found a five-fold increase um, in HIV infection in those countries with the worst criminalization policies. Um, but I think that there was another study that came out from Kaiser Family Foundation uh, looking at insurance coverage and viral suppression here in the U.S. that was also incredibly important, uh, where Kaiser really updated uh, the data looking at um, Medicaid um, and the degree to which people living with HIV HIV rely on Medicaid in the US. And it's about 40% for people living with HIV compared to 15% of the general population. Um, and Kaiser F Family Foundation also found that states that expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, um, that people with HIV were significantly more likely to be covered by Medicaid than states that had not expanded. Um, and that uninsurance rates um, were actually far higher in states that have not expanded Medicaid compared to those that had. Um, and then more importantly, you know, Kaiser also highlighted the disparities issue as well, finding that African Americans and Latinos with HIV were more than three times as likely as whites to be uninsured. So policies continue to matter. Policies continue to matter in terms of helping to bridge some of the disparities that we see in terms of trying to make sure that we have proper access for key populations and others. Um, and it was very clear that COVID-19 really helped shine a bright light on many of these issues of social determinants of health, as well as continuing disparities that we continue to see even in the HIV epidemic globally. Thanks, Greg. And also, I just want to say your, your plenary session was spectacular. And we all, you know, we all benefited from that. And congratulations. And thank you for that. Um, the second question we're getting to is has to do with is there a consensus forming around what type of threat COVID poses to HIV programs, interests, populations, providers, infrastructure, and the like. And I just want to say a few words before coming back to our speakers. The pandemic, we're talking about an overlay of two pandemics, one that's been around for almost 40 years and the other that's very new. They're very different pandemics, obviously. But as we've seen, the conference pivoted into looking at the the degree to which they be, have become intertwined with one another and independent. Now, the pandemic has been late, the COVID, the coronavirus pandemic has been late to arrive um, in Africa uh, as opposed to other continental experiences. 
It's taking off now, as we've seen. I mean, the dramatic surge that's underway, South Africa. But, you know, it arrived late. The vast majority of African countries in mid-March imposed pretty stiff lockdowns that flattened the curve that bought some time. Many of those lockdowns may not have been sustainable, and some of them were ultimately lifted. Other methods now we're seeing sort of a, an, an acceleration. But we don't have as much experience in terms of when you look at it in, in the course of early July, trying to reflect on how much of a threat does this truly pose, given that where we are in the arrival of the pandemic. Um, I think there's an appreciation, interestingly, in the discussion around what is possible in terms of getting a, a, a vaccine developed quickly uh, for COVID-19. It's been very interesting that the global infrastructure created over the last 25 years in terms of uh, HIV uh, field trial, clinical field trial infrastructure is turning out to be vitally important to that effort. And, um, and, and, and certainly that means that that, that infrastructure is, 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 is going to be, I, I believe, highly protected um, in this period. Um, you've, we've already talked about how what we've seen here in the COVID in terms of the inequities and the disparities and the disproportionate disproportionate burden and disproportionate vulnerabilities borne by certain populations, people of color, people who are poor, people with underlying conditions, the elderly and the like, that with that is being replicated and, and that the HIV population is very much um, within that. We know that this pandemic has struck in a universal way across the world and that has had, that has pushed many countries into a very inward perspective in a period of, of, of strong nationalism. A, a lack, there's been an absence of summitry around this, a very a void in terms of high level thinking. This, this a gathering at the International AIDS Conference is about a, the closest thing to a systematic and high level deliberation around what is the, what is this threat pose to these, to these programs. Um, the, but but we're in we're in an early point in this in this in in the in the response here, so the question that I'm putting to our speakers here, which is, has a consensus formed about the nature of the threat that COVID poses to the to the HIV AIDS efforts, um, and how how do we how do we characterize that? Is it a monumental and strategic threat that could very well overwhelm us in the coming year year and years? Or is it something that is perhaps less extreme and less severe and require, and, and we've already begun to see ways to, to manage and avert the worst outcomes? So I wanted to sort of put that question forward. How do you characterize the opinion climate coming out of this International AIDS Conference, which paid so much attention at trying to disaggregate and, 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 and illuminate what these impacts are does it amount to a strategic threat or does it amount to something less than that? Monica, you wanna kick things off? Yes, um, I did talk about COVID and HIV before and I just wanna spend one second before I answer this question to say if we, I, I did need to go back to the research just a little bit <laughs> for the science of the meeting because I didn't know if we weren't gonna come back to that. Um, I, I do wanna mention that there was more than HPTN 083 because that got so much attention and I think it was amazing that uh, intra, uh, intramuscular cabotegravir every week, eight weeks was actually superior to daily TDF FTC for um, MSM and transgender women. But um, but I think we need to see the resistance data and the concentration data out of that study as the authors kept on warning because there were these strange uh, breakthroughs on cabotegravir when it was given perfectly. So um, waiting for the resistance data on that because we definitely don't want to uh, kill INSTEs, um, which is our most important drug. And then I, I, uh, I really need to mention um, weight gain as uh, something that came out a lot at this meeting because uh, it is important to say that this was a bad meeting for metabolic effects and, and weight gain. I think TAF um, and Dolotegavir together in the advanced study had already at 48 weeks, the advanced study is comparing Dolotegavir and Efavirenz essentially, but with different um, formulations of TAF or TDF with the Dolotegavir and the weight gain kept on going up with women in the advanced study. Um, with Dolotegavir and TAF, and then TAF alone in a very big US-based cohort 
looked like there was a quite significant weight gain with 4.5 kilograms over nine months uh, with TAF if, instead of TDF. And the reason that's important is that this time for the first time we were seeing metabolic effects of that weight gain. So cardiovascular effects, lipid effects, um, hyperglycemia effects, and diabetes. So we can't ignore anymore that our therapies may be contributing to hearkening back to the early days of lipid dystrophy, maybe contributing to metabolic effects that we have to now as people live longer, we have to decide what we're willing to, to tolerate and um, figure out sparing regimens of, of maybe these nucleosides that are most associated with weight gain. Um, so to, to, to the, the um, the COVID and HIV story, I think there are four pillars of HIV control that are being affected by COVID. Those four pillars are HIV susceptibility, HIV testing, HIV prevention, and HIV treatment. And those are absolutely, at this meeting, all shown to already, in this relatively short period of time, to be in a very negative way affected by COVID-19. So HIV um, susceptibility to start with, I think there's this idea that people don't have um, HIV risk during a pandemic. Um, and there was, a, there was a survey of over 18,000 LGBTQ individuals um, around 138 countries uh, presented at the COVID meeting on the last day. Um, and what, uh, what the socioeconomic deprivation that occurs from COVID is doing in terms of people's livelihoods, in terms of people's HIV risk, selling sex for money, um, the, miser the misery of uh, what COVID is doing in terms of taking away people's fundamental um, rights and employment. And, and there's no doubt that uh, there's a concern that HIV susceptibility will increase uh, during COVID-19. So I think we need to get away from that question. There's higher rates of substance use, there's higher rates of overdose deaths in major cities around the country. That's the HIV susceptibility is not going to go down. HIV testing, this was not, um, at the meeting, there was a, there was a abstract from the Fenway uh, clinic in Boston about PrEP reduction, which I'll talk about in a minute, but an important finding of that paper is that HIV testing is down 85% in Boston during the last three months. We had a report in the Chronicle in San Francisco at the same time that the DPH um, here in San Francisco reported a 90% reduction in HIV testing over the last uh, three months, which means that when people go to the ER, they're all ruled out for COVID, um, even if they have fever and pharyngitis and rash um, and have HIV risk, but uh, they are never ruled out for HIV. People are just like, there's a massive turning away from HIV testing. Um, and that's, that's true in papers from uh, Kenya as well. And then the third is prevention, uh, that Fenway abstract that I told you about, um, PrEP, picking up your PrEP refills, even though it's all over the phone and telehealth, um, uh, that had reduced um, massively in the setting of, of COVID. Uh, there was a 200% increase in re refill um, relapses. Uh, and uh, so the impact on prevention, especially when PrEP was being considered like a secondary thing to do in, in low and middle income countries, um, is expected to be very high. And then HIV treatment, I think it's, I will, I will let Shannon please tell us about the model from UNAIDS from May, because that model has been haunting me. So I won't take away that thunder, but um, there was uh, quite a bit of um, a concern that this will affect HIV treatment outcomes. And, and in our clinic at Ward 86, which is an HIV clinic in, in San Francisco, we already have seen decrease in virologic suppression rates over the last three months exacerbated among the homeless. Um, there's, there's, in my mind, there's no doubt that those four pillars are going to be massively affected. And I really want to hear Shannon. So you would, Monica, you would characterize this as a historic strategic threat? Yes, definitely. Okay, thank you. Shannon. Yeah, um, thanks for that. I mean, I think I would say that there is a certain amount of consensus of how bad this could be. You know, and I'll talk a little bit about that and Monica started talking about that. I don't think that there's a full consensus of how we should react or act on that threat. 
Um, what do I mean? So, you know, consensus on multiple fronts on how bad this could be. Um, some of the modeling that we at UNAIDS did with WHO and a collection of um, the HIV modeling consortium did a what if, right? I said, okay, well, what if in Sub-Saharan Africa alone, since that's where so many people living with HIV are, what if there was a just a full stop six month interruption of services because of COVID? What would that do? If there was a six month interruption in treatment services, what would that do in terms of cost for people and people's lives? And that showed a six month inter interruption would likely cause uh, an extra 500,000 deaths from AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa alone. So double the number of deaths in just one year, knocking us all the way back to 2008 mortality rates. So losing a decade of progress in just one year and it would keep going from there. And we see the same kind of threats for mother to child transmission programs and Monica highlighted many of the additional threats due to economic issues and impoverishment and social determinants. So the threats are very real. Um, how we react or respond to that, I think we don't have a consensus about, certainly in the let's try to keep those interruptions from happening, doing everything we can to problem solve, there's consensus there. But in these bigger issues, I'm not sure there are. You know, and a few examples of that. Um, you know, we are in a year which we are setting uh, the targets for 2025 on the way to 2030, you know, these big global targets that countries around the world sign on to through the United Nations. And as the experts have been working on this before COVID, um, it was clear that even without COVID, um, a lot of countries weren't gonna make their 2020 targets. And there was a discussion like, well, if a country doesn't meet its 2020 targets, should we lower the standard for its 2025 targets? And there was a lot of heavy debate over this. And I think the, the consensus from civil society to academia to everyone was like, you know what? No, we can't lower those targets. We've got to do is enhance the strategies to catch up and accelerate. Um, but I think in the context where with COVID now, um, and you know, there are estimates coming back out similar to HIV that many of the sustainable development goal indicators might go back a decade. Um, I'm feeling a lot more, I'm hearing a lot more like, well, is it unrealistic to keep bold targets? Shouldn't we just sort of like lay off a little bit? Um, yet when you start to unpack country by country and being very, I think, sensitive to what that means for programs to catch up, you know, we see that in many cases when you impact country by country, what has gotten in the way of getting to 2020 can be a very focused gap. It can be missing men and missing children that just putting a pause or lowering the standards or giving an extra year or five years in general for the targets still will not fix that fundamental issue of who's being missed if there's not a focused and intensive strategy to address those gaps that were already there that are probably enhanced because COVID too. So my biggest fear, I guess, is that this lack of consensus will dilute the political will to have bold targets that will dilute the pressure for investments to say, you know what, even if the whole world's in an economic recession, I think we just experience what happens if you're not investing in the health of people before something big happens. I mean, this should be an argument for more investment, not less. And so I am worried that we might feed into um, futility factors or lower goals because it sounds so reasonable to be overwhelmed by COVID instead of using this as an opportunity to double down on the solutions, double down on the investments and double down on the leadership commitments it's gonna to take to really get us back on track. Thank you, Shannon. I just wanna make one remark here that late last week we did a session um, with Mark Lowcock, the Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and the Director of OCHA, along with two members of Congress, Susan Brooks and Ami Barra. Um, along with uh, Julie Gerberding uh, uh, from our commission. Um, the UN OCHA has put out a very, very dramatic statement uh, along with an appeal. The largest appeal in its entire history, $10.3 billion for 
I don't know, six month period. But the, you look at the analysis, there's 190 page analysis backing the five page appeal. And it's sweeping in terms of what lies on the horizon in terms of famine, extreme poverty, disruption of services, uh, and, and more. And the HIV community fits in that. The HIV world fits in that. And they're, and they're drawing from UNAIDS work and others in, in, in saying, this is what we are walking into. This is, this is what's on the horizon. And you know, sound, in terms of sounding the alarm to the world um, as to the urgency and the magnitude of the threats, this was, this was an astonishing document and argument, it seemed to me. And coming right after the AIDS conference is partly why I was motivated to, to try and ask this question of how much of a sense of urgency and alarm and what is it we're supposed to do? Because if these, if what is laid out in the scenarios of this is what's going to happen if there's inaction and an inadequate response, um, it's it's profound. Uh, and the countries that we're talking about, where the HIV program and footprint is the largest and where the burden is the largest, are the most vulnerable and across that spectrum of countries. Jen Cates, do you have thoughts on is this a strategic threat or something something more manageable? Well, I mean, I agree with, with what others said. It was There's a consensus that this is a strategic threat um, for all the reasons that, that were said. I, I That came through loud and clear, and I, I think everyone realizes it. And um, there's already the direct impacts that have that Monica was talking about that have been documented, um, the projected impacts um, from even small disruptions um, that we that have been modeled. Um, a couple other things I wanted, just uh, measures of direct impact I wanted to highlight, but then talk about two other factors. Um, the WHO did a survey of countries to assess uh, ARV stockout situation, and they found that 73 countries um, warned of that there were uh, risks of stockouts of ARVs, and 24 already reported critical, critically low stocks of AR, ARVs. That's danger, very, very much a danger zone. In addition, the Global Fund, um, which has mobilized a, a very quick response um, uh, of up to a billion dollars of, of funding that it, it's made available quickly, has also just recently made a decision to allow um, countries that it's funding to use its uh, online procurement platform to get PPEs and other uh, supplies. And if you go look at that, and you know they, they say we can turn around an approval for let's say PPEs in a very short period. There's still a one to two month wait to get those PPEs delivered by air and something like a three to five month wait by sea freight to get PPEs for companies. That is um, dramatic. That's, that's a strategic dis uh, a, a disruption that uh, likes of which we've not seen. Two other things that um, the other another impact I want to highlight because I, uh, I also I sit on the Office of AIDS Research advisory committee, I'm the chair of that committee, and one of the topics that we've been discussing um, at NIH is research recovery. Because while the most important immediate things are the threats to people's lives um, who are living with HIV or at risk from HIV, as we heard, there's also this research pipeline issue. And um, to the extent that clinical trials for HIV and other research have been disrupted and, and halted as labs have had to uh, you know, close and, and pause, um, that is gonna set back our our research um, trajectory for vaccines and for the other things. So there's that aspect too. Um, even the other issue that, that I think is really critical is funding because even before COVID, um, just like with UNAIDS annual update, we released our annual update in conjunction with UNAIDS and overall funding fell. This is pre COVID funding from all sources fell uh, in 2019 compared to the prior year. So in, instead of filling the gap, getting the gap smaller, what's needed, the gap is, is growing donor funding fell as well. And this is pre-COVID, and we know already that um, donors are are expressing are looking inward and wanting to respond to massive economic upheaval within their own countries. And that's gonna make funding low and middle income countries um, risky for them. And then also there's been so much emphasis in the last decade on domestic resource mobilization and all the projections from IMF and World Bank show that um, low and middle income countries are being hit so hard already that their, their ec economic prospects are, are severely curtailed. So the ability for them to um, uh, increase 
their own budget spending on HIV is uh, very at much at risk. So, I mean, this is those factors are have made a permanent, I think, impact on our future from the HIV perspective, um, and are also causing a rethink about all these approaches. So, I agree that there's not necessarily consensus for how to move forward, but there is definitely consensus that this is a fundamental impact. Thanks, Jen. Uh, two quick points, and then I want to ask Greg to weigh in. I mean. First point is to follow on what Jen just said, the debates over debt relief and debt forgiveness are at a, still at a very early point. And when you look at the projections in terms of the debt overhang and the lack of fiscal space in these countries to have capital available to respond is, 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 is woeful. And, and, and much more needs to be done on that front if we're looking at protecting HIV AIDS and other health Health, inf health investments. Um, the, the other point I wanna make is in terms of an ability to get US resources into the pipeline, the moment is upon us right now, which is the fourth COVID supplemental, which is under debate today. Uh, action may not be concluded until August. There is a proposal on the table of somewhere in the order of $20 billion toward, of international assistance going to a variety of purposes. There's a separate uh, proposal on HIV, which I believe is a $700 million over two year proposal. Um, but these, these are getting worked out right now. And it's, 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 it's a delicate and difficult thing. I mean, even in a one or two or tri $3 trillion package, where you see this type of 20 billion as a, as a minuscule component, it's politically very difficult to move, but we have seen some bipartisan movement within the Senate and within the House around this, and we should be hopeful. But this is the, our best shot at getting a major investment into the emergency humanitarian, into the HIV, um, and into the uh, COVID response and the vaccine preppers, those four streams all are embodied in that in that proposal in some form. The HIV has not figured as prominently in those debates and could figure more prominently. Greg, your thoughts on, uh, is this a strategic threat? And if so, what should we do about it? Thank, thanks, Steve. You, you actually mentioned what I was gonna mention in terms of what's taking place right now on Capitol Hill uh, and, and the degree to which the COVID response as well as um, our response for global health is really just, is, is dovetailing. Um, but I think one thing that I would mention that has not been mentioned is, um, you know, vaccines. You know, right now we're in the process of um, go going into phase three trials for some of the candidate vaccines. And we know how important it is going to be to have some of these vaccines distributed uh, domestically as well as globally. Um, many of the reasons that Monica and others had said beforehand, the disruptions that we're seeing uh, both domestically as well as globally in terms of healthcare services, disruptions in terms of people's livelihoods, et cetera. Um, and I think one of the looming questions next year, if we have one or two viable vaccines is, you know, what is the distribution going to look like for some of these vaccines? And what are the implications going to be uh, for the economies of many of these different countries that may not have the same access uh, to vaccines as other um, uh, 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 nations do? Um, and I think that that's going to be a question that we'll all be talking about next year during the International AIDS Conference to try and figure out whether or not um, the vaccines are going to be able to help try and level some of the playing field and stabilize some of the economies um, that, that, that are being disrupted uh, by COVID-19, um, as well as the um, monies that are being misplaced uh, from HIV towards dealing with COVID-19 in various um, uh, uh, countries. Thank you. Um, we've got about 12 minutes left and um, we wanted to touch on the question of what do people think about a virtual conference? What, what did we learn from this and what worked, what didn't work and what's the future likely to look like? We also have a question, a very important question around key population led organizations. And should we be as a matter of priority, looking ahead, investing, paying much more attention uh, in strengthening their capacity key population organizations in country so they can they they can be better equipped to do the kind of rapid studies and report on service delivery and coping with these threats. So I want to add that question in and I want to circle around and ask people to respond to both that key population
question, but also this question, what did we learn from this conference? Was it successful? Was it something that still carried, Monica, the spirit and the and the all of the work that was done in San Francisco and Oakland and did it did it still convey that spirit and and reality of how much mobilization there was? What did you think, Monica? Uh, I would have to say no, unfortunately. I'm not gonna like pretend that this wasn't profoundly disappointing. This was um, bringing um, uh, the International AIDS Conference to a city uh, is like the Olympics. Like it's exciting to have it in the city. There are uh, massive opportunities for mobilization, for fundraising for the city, for bringing uh, back for the city. And to be honest, uh, it was so, so disappointing. And um, there were, there is nothing to replace in-person interaction in my mind for advocates and patients and clinicians and researchers and policymakers and government officials and everything that the International AIDS Conference is to come together. So I, I, I'll now say something positive and 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 optimistic, but I, I'm not going to pretend that I wasn't profoundly disappointed, and so was everyone else. And no, I didn't see my local San Francisco thing, and the fact that I introduced Jane Goodall, and that it was such an incredible honor, and my was wearing pajama bottoms. Like, yeah, this is no, this is not the, like this is not the same thing. But okay, so to, let's go to the positive. So uh, the idea here would be. Um, and I think it's true uh, that uh, there are people who actually cannot travel, obviously, and it is expensive and it is a big deal. And whether you have 25,000 people coming together, often for these international AIDS conferences, many people get left out. And it is um, by making a platform that's accessible, then you will increase accessibility. And it wasn't free, I mean, meaning registrations were allowed uh, even into the meeting, which is different than an in-person meeting. Um, but the AIDS 2020 meeting wasn't, um, though there were a lot of scholarships, it wasn't free. The COVID meeting, however, was. So the um, IAS decided, and I think very fairly, to make the COVID meeting completely free for um, to register because there were clinical implications for people to hear about and prevention and transmission around the country as there's a, uh, around the world as there was a big pandemic happening. And it was important to hear from um, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Slim Kareem and Dr. Burks and Bill Gates spoke in that and Mary Robinson and Jane Goodall and it, Bill Gates, you know, it was, it was an exciting like lineup uh, to hear from people who were, who were thinking about it so much. Um, and then the UNAID Secretary General uh, closed it out. Um, but, and Dr. Tedros actually opened as well from the WHO. But um, so I do think that accessibility was helpful in terms of a platform, to be honest, we learned a lot. Um, you know, when people were on it all at once, it wasn't as easy for everyone to be on it. I think now people can go back in time and look at the talks, but people will have had to remember to sign their consent so no one can get Dr. Peter Piat's talk yet because we need him to just really quickly sign his consent. Um, so there's just like, you know, there are issues that happen when it's online. So I, can't, I guess my overall message is there was no choice. It went the best that it could go. I think accessibility will be there for many, for a long time, but nothing for me replaces what we could have had, which is in person. And I think all of us wish COVID-19 was not happening. Thank you, Monica. That's very eloquent and powerful. <laughs> uh, and I, I can feel it. Um, Shannon. Yeah, and I promise I did not plant the community key pop led question. Um, but to take that on first, uh, absolutely are we, you know, seeing more than ever the need to consider community led, key population led, essentially organizations led by affected people for affected people, um, the need to invest in those kind of an organizations for uh, as part of the core infrastructure and resilience of our health and our beyond health responses, period. Um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to take a little bit of a, a, a nuanced exception to the idea of, of capacity, building capacity and just say, you know what, we got to start funding. <laughs> there is plenty of capacity that is there and can be built, but it's being starved to death by a lack of funding and a contracting civil society space. Um, we we've done, I think, in recent years. Um, 
some good funding of community-led organizations for direct service delivery. And thank goodness, because these are a lot of the organizations that are maintaining services and being creative under COVID. Um, but there are two other really core functions of KPOP and community-led organizations. One is participation in governance and advocacy, being at the policy and decision-making tables. And it's become over the years harder and harder to get the funding for organizations to do that work. Um, and when we see our COVID national responses, despite advocacy, we are seeing that community-led organizations are in fact usually not at the national COVID decision-making tables. And that's a problem. On the other side, we see the, the real need for key pop and community-led organizations in the accountability and community-led monitoring side. Is what's happening on the ground actually meeting the standards of what was promised and the quality that needs to be delivered? And is there a feedback loop for that? Um, you know, so we saw actually some really good data at the conference on how that can change services. But yes, absolutely, we need to be investing in key pop led and community led organizations as a core integral, inseparable part of a resilient health infrastructure. Um, second, on the on the virtual meeting, um, uh, I think looking forward, there are just to build on what God, uh, Monica said. Of course, this doesn't replace an in-person meeting. Um, some things are really were, were for me really surprisingly good. I found actually the quality of a lot of the content, um, maybe with so much that had to be filmed ahead. Um, the presentations, every single presentation I watched uh, was gangbusters. The content was out of this world. So I don't know if it was the pressure of having to film, you know, as a compliment to some of the live sessions, but I, I just thought that the content was fantastic and I'm glad that is captured in an accessible way that we can keep replaying. Um, you know, we got Greg here, but I know I have been filmed ahead, but you know, clearly the pressure was on and he was fabulous. Um, I think one thing though, um, that, I, that I think we have to really be thoughtful about going forward is I think we all know just to talk about a sensitive issue a little bit, you know, directly that there was some fracturing in the planning of this conference between HIV 2020 and AIDS 2020. Um, that was really unfortunate. Um, and, and I was, you know, I sort of hoped that because everything sort of switched up and became virtual that that fracturing maybe would go away in the virtual setting. But I didn't get the sense that we fully remedied that fracturing or built those bridges. And so I just think we all, as we look forward to the next year and the next two years and what comes next, we just have to be very purposeful about reuniting our entire audience and using these great new tools to do so. And I'm very confident we'll be able to do that. Thanks so much, Shannon. Um, we're going to run a few minutes over, if that's okay. We're going to hear from from Jen and from Greg on this question of what did we learn and what, what do you think of this conference? And then we're gonna come back and ask each of them to speak for one minute on the question of what gives you the greatest hope in the midst of all of this uncertainty and drama and risk. Over to you, Jen, uh, what did you think of this? What did you make of this sure. virtual I'll, I'll be conference? quick, um, I'll be quick because I, I really, agree with, with Monica and Shannon, but also in the interest of full disclosure, I'm a member of the IAS Governing Council, which is like the board of the IAS. Um, I should have said that in the beginning, and I, um, but in that capacity, uh, the Governing Council isn't the planner of the conference, but we really, you know, had to, uh, we supported the IAS uh, staff in making some very difficult decisions, and I really want to commend them for doing this under very, very difficult um, circumstances. Uh, I, you know, as everyone has said, I mean, if, uh, having a virtual conference in the midst of an emergency when that wasn't what you were planning to do is not a perfect science. Um, and so it, what, you know, sometimes the bandwidth wasn't good enough or whatever, but I, on balance, the fact that it happened, the fact that so much good material got presented, it was democratization by allowing more and more people to participate are really good signs. And I think um, going forward now, when you can start planning a virtual conference from the outset. That is your goal. You can get a, you can, it can be much, much better. I mean, you don't, it, this was really to quickly go from in person in a complicated way to online in a complicated way at the last minute. So some of the challenges were, were, were really that. But I think by and large, it's, it is going to be the wave of the future. I'm wondering what in person will look like 
for things. And I, I know there will still be in person, but when and how will be a big question. I think this proves that you can do a virtual meeting um, and share information and it has advantages. Um, so I'll just, I'll leave it at that. On the KP side, completely agree. Um, I'm gonna defer that to Greg because he's actually in doing that work right now in terms of building capacity. I think AMFAR is uh, with, with key populations in country. So um, thanks. Okay, great, Greg. Sure, I'll, I'll be really brief. Um, in terms of um, the uh, conference going virtual, I have nothing but kudos for the you know, International Aid Society, the whole team. Um, it's, it's, I can't imagine moving from a 20,000 in-person conference to a virtual format within a matter of months. And it's, it's just incredibly difficult. And I really think that the team did an incredible job of trying to pull this off as, as, as well as possible and, and did a good job in, in pulling quite a few things off. Um, in terms of the um, of, of what's taking place in the centrality of KP organizations, I mean, absolutely, that, that's something that I um, spent a lot of time on my plenary talking about, um, about the centrality of KP organizations. One thing that we do see in the COVID response, and, and it's been wonderful to see is that um, HIV scientists have taken a lead uh, in the COVID response. And, and I think that there is a plus there for us to remind um, policymakers as well as um, the, uh, global citizens overall about how important HIV scientists have been um, in addressing infectious disease, whether it be Ebola, COVID-19, um, or other infectious diseases. Where I think there's a deficit, though, um, is that we're not having as much attention being paid to KP-led organizations um, and, and to community-based organizations. Uh, we know that COVID-19 is stigmatized. HIV is stigmatized as well. We know that community-led organizations and KP-led organizations know how to reach communities um, that have been stigmatized. We know that we need uh, to have contact tracing for COVID-19 to try and get the epidemic under control. Um, and yet we are not funding any of these organizations who've been doing this work, quite frankly, for decades, who know how to do this work, who have connections to these communities uh, to do that work for the COVID-19 response. So I'm hoping that um, in, in the years to come or over the next year, that we could actually see some COVID-19 funding going to KP-led organizations, to community-based organizations to really help address that response um, and for those organizations to get the recognition that they deserve, not only in addressing HIV, uh, but for COVID-19 as well. Thank you, Greg. Okay, we're getting towards the close here. I wanna say one thing. First of all, um, this conversation brings across again, one of the remarkable features of this community uh, that works in the world of HIV AIDS, which is it's a community that has leadership with remarkable talent, continuity and longevity. All of you have dedicated your lives over many, many years to this field and, and it brings an incredible depth of perspective. And what you've said this, this today in this short period is, is both very sobering, but also very inspiring. And, um, and I wanna thank you all for, the, for what you've done, the, the commitments and the leadership you've shown and over, over many, many years, it's quite inspiring. Um, we've asked the speakers to give us one minute each in closing on where do you find the greatest hope and strength as you, as you look ahead in the midst of all of the challenges and uncertainties and risks that we've talked about today. Monica, thank you for being with us. It's great to see you. And uh, I'm gonna ask you to kick this off. Yeah, I um, actually am feeling quite prof Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I am fine. I am actually feeling profoundly hopeful um, about, uh, in uh, my heroes, Angela Davis and Cornell West. I've been listening a lot to them during this time of um, uh, protest around the country. Um, in 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 reaction to several deaths um, and police brutality, but it was really in reaction to everything. And people in the setting of COVID nineteen have both time and somehow have turned their attention to uh, how unfair and the disproportionate impact of COVID on racial and ethnic minorities in this country, and and so is HIV. And I think this feels unprecedented. I know right now there's 
oppression that's trying to go on in cities um, from the other end. But I, I am feeling really like this is unprecedented and I feel hopeful. And I feel like everyone's thinking about the disproportionate impact of infectious diseases on poor people, which we've been about for 30 years. And if people are thinking about that more, I feel like something could change. So I'm, I'm feeling hopeful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shannon. Wow, we might all converge on a lot of things. Um, I, I am hopeful in our chaos, actually. I am hopeful with this convergence of HIV, of COVID, of racial inequalities um, for what it seems to be meaning for people's real understanding across a lot of countries and a lot of settings of what um, structural inequalities really look like that it's not just about one person here and one person there, but what an uneven playing field on so many different elements means when a crisis happens. Um, it's nothing new to us in HIV, but I feel like that there is not just the activism, but also more of an appreciation and understanding on that than there's ever been before. And that's a huge moment in time. And I think when that goes along at a very practical level um, of some of the things that Craig, Greg already mentioned, which is, and you know what, HIV leaders, not just scientists, but HIV leaders are stepping up around the world in the COVID response. The scientists, yes, but also the number of, you know, current and previous NAC directors that have been called in to lead the national responses. Um, the community-led organizations who, despite not being deemed essential service providers, not despite not being funded, are stepping up and creating solutions for their um, communities. Um, I think this just reemphasizes to me the privilege I feel being part of this community, which is we don't wait to be asked. We certainly don't let anyone put us in the corner and we say nothing is impossible. We can meet this challenge, overcome it, but we can only do that together. Thanks so much, Shannon. That's very, very eloquent. Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, I can't top what Shannon and Monica just said. I those actually, I feel more hopeful having listened to them. Um, to try. Yeah, I, no, I, I mean, the, off the, hook. All, the only, the, I'll have two things. One is, um, and it relates to what they said. With HIV, um, there were many years and still often are where people working on HIV were yelling to be heard. Not everyone heard. It was a phenomenon that we, it is a phenomenon that we, we know, those of us working in it affects everybody in some way, but it's not, a pub, there's not a public consciousness of it. This COVID um, is a global phenomenon in a way that um, we've never experienced, where virtually everybody is, is aware of some, something extremely profound that is affecting everyday life. And while, um, and that's you know, led to hardship and it's um, dis the disparities and all of the things people said, it, it, that kind of um, reach does have the potential, I think, to lead to, to change. So I do get hope in that. And the second thing that I that is something I learned early on in HIV is what gives me hope is Tony Fauci. If Tony Fauci is involved, um, I have hope. So um, that that's my, I'll leave you with that. Thank you. We'll have uh, Tony Fauci here for an interview at 1.30 this afternoon, Eastern time. So please tune in if you wish. Greg, you get the last voice here this morning. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think what gives me hope is the fact that the conference gave us a glimpse of what can be. Um, and, and what I mean in terms of what can be um, when we use science um, in, in, in HIV to make a difference. Um, there were two studies that did not get a lot of attention that I thought were really important. Um, and both of them were prep studies in generalized epidemics. There was one um, with Project ECHO that found that just 25% of women up to PrEP, but there was a 50% fall in the rate of HIV infection um, for people who are part of that study. And then there was a second study um, from the search study in Kenya, where they found that PrEP prevents an estimated three quarters of HIV infection. Uh, among people there. So there's a big drop in incidents despite low use of PrEP. That gives me a lot of hope that even with low use of PrEP within generalized epidemics that we can see these huge drops 
um, in new infections and just getting that glimpse of what can potentially occur um, if we still continue to invest in global HIV, if we continue to invest in science, if we continue to invest in communities, uh, gives me hope. Um, and, and, and I want to hang on to that hope uh, to, to, to make sure that we actually get to the goals that we've set forth by 2025 as well as 2030. Thanks so much, Greg, and thanks to all of our speakers. Monica's had to exit. Uh, for a, to take another call. Um, we're at the, at the close here. Again, I wanna repeat my thanks to all of our speakers for being with us today and for the audience that's joined over the course of this hour to Maggie McCartan Gibbs, John Mons, Clifton Jones, who put the program together so flawlessly and skillfully. So we are adjourned. We'll see you in two more years when we come back to do this again, right, Jen? Definitely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.